Mr. Mauro, may I have your opinion about why is it so difficult to translate the rhetoric into actions, particularly structural reform for every country? I saw your smile on your face. You probably have a really good answer for this, Mr. Mauro. <laughs> well, indeed, it is, it is difficult because uh, structural reform is a very vague term and uh, the priorities differ uh, across countries. Uh, normally, when I think of structural reform, I think of liberalization of the economy. I think of uh, reducing regulations, reducing restrictions, making it easier for uh, firms to hire and fire workers, for people to move within their country mm -hmm. or even across national boundaries. Uh, so it's a whole host of possible measures and the priorities there differ very much across countries. Uh, for some countries the priority would be to uh, speed up the uh, processes whereby you adjudicate uh, civil lawsuits. For other countries it may be labor market reform and the way that this is translated into practice is to have a system of peer monitoring uh, yes. among the G20, but this is not a very well developed system. Uh, it's not something that features on the front page of the domestic well, newspapers. So there's a good intention, but the implementation is something that still remains to be seen. But Mr. Mauro, uh, briefly from you, if you can, when the growth rate of the global economy is going down, likely to be 3.4 or even lower by April, is it possible for economies and pragmatic for economies to do structural reform? Let's just talk about realities. Well, I think it is possible. Um, I think at the same time we should not overstate the degree of crisis or emergency. I think at the end of the day, we are not in a global recession. Uh, certainly, the United States is growing at a normal pace. It has something close to full employment. Europe is recovering. It's not growing very fast, but it is growing. Uh, again, there are differences across countries, but things are okay. They're on the, on the right track. If you look at the emerging markets, it's very different across emerging markets. Uh, you have India still growing very fast, mm -hmm. you have China where there's discussion of a potential slowdown, but what we are seeing is that uh, the numbers are still uh, giving us a very mild slowdown. The economy is still growing at 6-7%, which is unheard of for an advanced economy. And then you have Brazil and Russia which are in recession, so it's very different. Now, can you do structural reforms in a situation of uh, crisis, yes, sometimes that's okay. the moment to do it. Uh, but again, we're not in a crisis. Uh, so I would say we're in a situation where there's a lot of discussion uh, of structural reforms, but the reality is that countries are trying to do the best they can for themselves. Oh, I see. And it's good that there's international dialogue, but I'm not sure that countries are going to do more than they would well, uh, if you, simply on the basis of their own self-interest. If you talk about the numbers, let's take a look at the numbers. You said the economy is not necessarily uh, slowing down as some has uh, indicated in the press, for example. But take a look at this. According to the IMF's figure, the emerging economies, in excluding China in this point, excluding China, gained only 1.92 growth last year, even lower than the developed economies 1.98%. It is the very first time the emerging economy's growth is lower than that of the developed world since the year 2009. Some say this is already a story of decline of the emerging economies, of course, in this case, excluding China. Professor Liu, you've been attentive listening to your American colleagues. What is your judgment? Is this a, a very difficult economic realities that we are facing, and therefore structural reform, is it still pragmatic? Well, um, five years so ago, people really... There. Professor Liu, in Beijing, please. Yes, five years ago, people bet on uh, the Asia 
and most of the emerging economies that, uh, uh, that are dragging the uh, global recovery. And right now, it's a really uh, a blurred reality now uh, when those uh, uh, developing countries are faced with its own problem, uh, uh, be it interest rate issue, be it inflation issue, mm -hmm. be it labor issue. Well, I think it boils down to a matter of management. So uh, people always said there is no really underdeveloped country, but there, there is uh, a lot of uh, undermanaged country. So uh, management turned out to be a challenge both at the uh, government level and also at the business level. So right now, uh, when the global economy is seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, I'm not really very uh, optimistic about uh, whether we have really moved out of this uh, uh, cycle of a recession. So before we really get full recovered, we may have the risk uh, to fall into another trap of uh, our, the uh, a vicious cycle okay. if uh, we do not really cooperate well. If, if Let's just put whether we're in another recession or the beginning of another cycle or not for later discussion. Let's just concentrate on what this G20 finance ministers and central bank governors eventually decided. They talk about, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy and structural reform all go at the same time. But obviously over the past year, everybody knows that every country is focusing on the previous two which is the fiscal policy and the monetary policy. Yeah. How to avoid what they consider as so-called a competitive devaluation of uh, everyone's currency in order to pay to get an upper hand of export? That is the question. Would claiming, promising at these kind of meetings necessarily going to lead to actions? Well, uh it is good we see uh, uh, increased consensus uh, at the, uh, this round of G20, but uh, uh, as uh, discussed, that, that there are really different inter uh, interpretations, different agenda, different priorities in the structural reform and different understanding among different policymakers mm. so far. So therefore, we really expect that uh, based on this consensus, there can be more transparent agenda. Uh, so that uh, the world can really have a collective uh, uh, action so towards the uh, a, a constructive right. movement. Well, so that also is related with the uh, uh, elimination of uh, the rising protectionism that, that is underway. Well, well, all of these, what you said, Professor Liu, sound wonderful, but uh, uh, Mr. Maura, what do you consider as the most effective way to avoid this uh, competitive devaluation. You already mentioned about uh, peer monitoring. Of course, uh, G20 is a system, but uh, it has not yet uh, gone into the most mature stage in order to have it possible. So what about the other mechanisms? Will countries' pledges eventually lead to actions from your perspective? Well, if I have to make a guess on the main policies that countries are going to use in the next year or so, I would say that if you're looking at the case of Europe, we will soon see a little bit more stimulative monetary policy. So perhaps uh, a slight reduction in interest rates going a little bit more negative. I would advocate more uh, quantitative easing in Europe. Uh, in the United States, I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of new policy measures uh, simply because fiscal policy is not going to take any actions mm -hmm. between now and the elections. Uh, on monetary policy, I think that uh, we may see a couple of very small, very gradual increases in interest rates, if at all, in the United States. Um, so, uh, in Europe, uh, on fiscal policy, there's a bit of a uh, discussion going on with several countries pressuring Germany to do more stimulus, but I don't see that that's going to be very likely. The one thing that could happen is that with the intensification of the refugee crisis in Europe, uh, countries are going to agree that spending to integrate uh, refugees may be something that could be excluded from the uh, fiscal rules and I therefore let's uh, if that happens you might see a small let's fiscal have, stimulus there. Right, let's have uh, our European guest uh, Daniel Gross uh, who is joining us. Uh, Mr. Gross is the uh, director of the Center for European Policy Studies. Mr. Gross, um, obviously you heard a lot 
talk uh, coming from your American counterpart talking about the European policies. You got a lot of things on hand. First of all, the last crisis seems to be not yet ending. Secondly, you got migrant crisis, which is more political. And thirdly, you also got several countries, particularly the UK, talking about the exit the EU uh, unless uh, it is being in a way met with certain kinds of uh, policies and policy changes. So, Mr. Gross, what do you make of all of this? This looks almost like a perfect storm for Europe. Uh, we have crisis on all imaginable policy fields. So all we can do at this point is to take these, tackle these things one by one. The UK problem has been tackled in the sense that uh, David Cameron has been given a special deal. Mm -hmm. Now it's up to him to sell it to the British public. On the refugee crisis, uh, there's not much actually Europe can do. The action is now with member countries and with a non-member country, namely Turkey. If they don't stop the flow, again, Europe can only take these refugees and does its best. On the economic side, however, I think the worst is behind us. The European economy is actually improving slowly but nicely. And employment is actually doing better in Europe than the United States. So I think the economic crisis is pretty much behind us, but the other two crises, they still have to be dealt with. Mm. Well, that's the situation in Europe. What about China? Uh, G20 meetings are supposed to be occasions, particularly when it's being held in China, in which uh, developing countries, emerging economies, particularly China, to ask the rest of the community as to whether emerging economies should have the proportion that they are promised to have in terms of the economic governing of the world. But this time, of course, Chinese officials had a lot to explain. Yes. Professor Liu, you understand this better than I do. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang promised the international communication, uh, international community rather, of China's, quote, having enough resources to deal with so-called downward pressure of the economy. Um, what do you make of his promises? And also Central Bank Governor Zhou Xiaotuan, together with the Finance Minister Lou Jiwei's repeated confirmation about the prospect of the Chinese economy. Well, I think now uh, in the government hands, they have a number of toolkits. You know, they have the uh, uh, now uh, gradually rolling out the uh, more pro uh, aggressive uh, the uh, uh, monetary policy. Uh, so there is a uh, uh, visible easing of uh, the uh, uh, money into the liquidity, so that currently sharp the stock exchange performance and, and uh, also provide a more uh, friendly financial environment for Chinese economic growth. The other is supply side uh, reform. By uh, right now, you know the uh, State Council has pledged 100 billion uh, to transfer the scale of uh, possible laid out of workers by uh, reducing the excessive capacity. I see. And uh, Li Keqiang is uh, so much so resolved to uh, continue to cut down the red tapes that are in the way of economic growth and efficiency. And uh, also China's uh, export is uh, uh, experiencing difficulty, but still we may remain the number one exporter in China. And uh, also see. we see the continued uh, increase in the flow of uh, uh, both foreign direct investment to China and also outbound investment from China. Okay, so you give a long list about uh, what are some of the plus Chinese economy is having right now in order to guarantee the growth. But Mr. Cross, what about from your perspective? You know, things about the debts, things about the securities markets, things about the confidence of the Chinese economy, things about how Chinese community, rather Chinese economy, is interacting with the rest of the world, policy-wise and uh, action-wise. What is your judgment, Mr. Groves? I always have to distinguish between what uh, certain policy is supposed to achieve and what it might actually achieve in the end. So if I look at the Chinese monetary policy right now, I hear that the purpose is to stimulate more investment in China. But China is also an economy where there are more savers than investors. It's a huge saving surplus. So lowering interest rates will cut into the interest earnings of savers, who then might have less money to spend. And therefore, I'm not so sure that lower interest rates will actually stimulate the Chinese economy, especially consumption in China, which one should do. So I'm a bit skeptical that uh, the current policy direction will actually achieve what is needed, because what is needed is to foster consumption, mm. and that might need more fiscal policy than monetary policy. Professor Liu, 
that is only one aspect that Mr. Gross talked about. But there are many other aspects, for example, about the exchange rate regime. China is reforming it, but as a result, we see different kinds of uh, phenomena emerging. Uh, some worry about capital flights, others say this is not a problem at all. Of course, we see debates coming from all sides. What is your uh, judgment about the Chinese government's capabilities and the Chinese economy's capabilities of managing its own path? I think the, uh, the direction is very clear that Ch the Chinese government is so resolved to, uh, uh, to continue the liberalization process of the uh, uh, Chinese RMB, uh, both for its international status and also for domestic reform and also for the attraction of more foreign uh, capital uh, into China. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, this decision has to meet a number of challenges. Number one is that uh, we have been uh, not very experienced mm -hmm. in managing a free-flowing money, uh, monetary uh, issue. And uh, number two is that we really wanted to sharp the domestic uh, economic growth rate uh, while uh, we maintain a more stable monetary policy. So that's something, uh, you know, uh, sometimes at the grudge. And uh, uh, again, the uh, supply side reform also need more predictability mm -hmm. uh, while we allow the market fluctuation in a wider band. So these are the issues that uh, we have to uh, be very careful. So lastly, I think uh, more of the uh, global financial speculators, they are in a tug of war with the Chinese uh, uh, policymakers and also Chinese bankers. And let's see who is going to win out in the end.